Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's web conference. My name is Dan Painter. I am the, <clears throat> excuse me, the product training and development manager at Flint Walling, and I will be hosting today's broadcast titled Irrigation Pumps 101. Um, just before we get started, just a couple of uh, quick notes here that uh, you may be interested in. Early next week, we are going to be publishing uh, another uh, schedule of web conferences. I know I've got two scheduled for next week, but this one that we're going to be posting next week will carry us through the month of June. Uh, we're going to bring in some additional topics. Uh, I did one last week uh, for the first time. I think it was last week. It uh, was on our floating fountain pond pump systems, which uh, I think was pretty well attended. I'm going to uh, be putting that back out there. Uh, something that I've done too for uh, people that come to our factory, whether they're distributors or contractors, when they come to our factory uh, for a, a tour and uh, you know a day of classroom training, one of the things I start them off with is a history, historic timeline of Flint and Walling. It's a very interesting story that we have, and uh, you know if you don't know this, this company is well over 150 years old. They've never left this location that they started in. Uh, so there's a lot of uniquenesses there. So I, I just kind of paint a little picture of our timeline. And then that's followed up with a, a complete product overview. It's very brief, but uh, it will al allow someone to see all the various products that Flint and Walling does manufacture up in Kendallville, Indiana. And I know that a lot of times when I've done that in classroom, I've had contractors come up and they'll make comments they, hey we, you know we didn't know you made this or you made that and uh so anyway uh we're going to be putting out some uh, additional topics for june so be looking for that anyway today is uh irrigation pumps 101 and um when we uh talk about irrigation pumps um we're going to break these down into we're going to break them down into two uh, two types and then we break those two types down into two more types so it's a, it, it, just a bunch of multiples of two you'll see as we go through today uh, what I'm talking about there but uh, just on the very very basic side of it uh, if we were going to categorize pumps that are used in irrigation uh, we could start off by saying that there's one category that's referred to as submersible pumps uh, I'm going to Pull my laser up here. So these are uh, typical four-inch submersible pumps, uh, oftentimes used in irrigation, particularly our 19 and 27 gallon per minute series, uh, these two four-inch subs here. And they're available uh, from, and typical irrigation uh, will require probably a horse, horse and a half, um, maybe a two horse. Uh, then we also have our high cap models, uh, these two on the right-hand side. Hopefully you can see my laser pointer on your screen, but uh, these have two inch discharges versus the inch and a quarter uh, that these uh, smaller models have. But the uh, high cap series are, uh, they run 35, 55 and 85 gallon per minute. I think we build those up to about seven and a half horsepower. Um, and then there's also a submersible pump, very similar to one you're seeing out here. Uh, that we place in a slotted screen, PVC screen, and this becomes our floating fountain uh, pond pump system, which I briefly spoke of a few minutes ago, and it, it has its own actual uh, uh, web conference. Along with each of these, uh, the pump ends are going to be a separate web conference. The submersible motors will be a separate web conference. So again, I'm going to ask everybody to keep looking at that schedule because we are going to throw some new topics up. But submersible pumps would be one category of uh, pumps that are conducive to being used in irrigation. The uh, second category we refer to as above ground pumps. And uh, obvious, uh, these pumps are not submerged in water unlike their counterpart submersibles, but these pumps are typically uh, installed above ground. Uh, they consist of uh, centrifugal pumps and self-priming pumps and uh, jet pumps and shallow well jet pumps which are also used in uh, irrigation and then down at the bottom right you see a little uh, what's called a city water pressure booster pump and this is not only used for uh, boosting home uh, pressure uh, pressure within a home but it's um, more popularly used within uh, small irrigation systems to boost pressure 
for those. So the the purpose of today is when we're all done uh, that we can look at a pump. Just I mean, even if it's an outline of a pump, and be able to identify that. Uh, that particular pump without the need of looking up the model number or resorting to a catalog or literature, just through simple visual uh, observation of these pumps, uh, we should be able to easily identify one from another. Uh, so that with that, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start with the above ground pumps. And as I mentioned a minute or two ago, uh, we're gonna always be busting things down into categories of two. So we start off with the very basics, submersibles and above ground. When we get to above ground, uh, we'll break those down into two categories. And uh, those two categories would be uh, either jet pumps or uh, centrifugal pumps. So again, these, these are two categories of above ground pumps. Uh, with that, we're gonna go to the jet pumps. There are two types again. So I don't want this to become too confusing. It's really quite simple. There's two types of jet pumps. Uh, one is referred to as a shallow well jet pump, as you see on the left-hand side of your screen. The other one on the right can oftentimes be referred to as a deep well jet. I would say that uh, a shallow well seems to be more popular and, and predominant in irrigation than the deep well pump does. But uh, nonetheless, uh, the, the reason that uh, they call these jet pumps, I guess, is uh, I get asked that every once in a while. You know, hey, you know, why do they call a jet pump a jet pump? I was in a classroom one day, and that question came up from a contractor. Well, another contractor raised his hand up, and I asked him, I said, you know the answer? He goes, oh, yeah. I said, what is it? I said, well, have you ever heard one run? Yeah, you know, only a few hundred times. Why? He goes, well, they sound like a damn jet. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know what brand you were listening to, sir, but it obviously wasn't a Flint and Walling. But I'll give you the reason why I think they call them a jet pump. It's an opinion. But each of these pumps, uh, whether they're shallow well or deep well, require a component referred to as a jet or an ejector. Ejector seems to be, a, both those terms are a little, a little dated, uh, old school, but uh, these are called jets or ejectors. So for example, up here on the left-hand side, the shallow well jet, uh, this, this shallow well jet pump, its jet or ejector, as you can see here, is bolted right to the face, right to the front of the pump, where a deep well uh, jet or ejector is gonna have to be located much closer to the water source. And we'll get into that here in a little while. Uh, but because it has to be closer to the water source, obviously uh, uh, it's not mounted to the front of the pump like the shallow well is. So uh, these pumps that I have on the screen are actually referred to as convertible jets. Um, uh, the meaning behind that is that I could take either one of these pumps, just the pump itself, and dependent upon which ejector I would put with it, uh, I would either make it a shallow well if it gets the uh, this ejector here, um, or if it were the deep well, it would come with the ejector. It's going to be mounted close to the water source, but these pumps can be used for either shallow or deep well applications depending upon the ejector that you're going to use with them. So that's why they're referred to as convertible jets. There are also some non-convertible shallow well pumps that are uh, available, and quite frankly, these are very, very popular here in the irrigation industry, and that's the CK series that you see down here on the bottom of the screen. That is a shallow well uh, jet pump. Uh, if you look at the front of that pump, it's got a little snout on it, a little ejector that's actually an in it's integral part of the casting. So it, this cannot be taken off and replaced. This is a part of that front pump casting, so this would always and could only be used for shallow well applications. So it would be a straight up uh, shallow well pump, again, because of that casting uh, there on the front of it. So let's talk about how they work. Um, again, if I'm in a classroom, uh, I'm talking about how a jet pump works. If I'm in a classroom uh, of contractors and I'm standing up in the front of the room, I might role play this out with you a little bit, but oftentimes I'll tell the contractors, let's just suppose that this wall behind me had a hose bib that was sticking out of it. And if I grabbed a piece of garden hose and I hooked it up to the hose bib and I opened that faucet up full bore and I stood up here in the front of this class, 
I probably could get the first row wet. And whether I could hit those y'all back there in that second row or not would be dependent upon how much pressure is coming out of that hose bit because uh, that's what I would need to do to get to that second row. But the people that are all the way in the back of this classroom, they're safe. I mean, there's not enough pressure coming out of there to bump that water all the way back there unless I do one thing, and we have all done this, and that is simply place my thumb over the end of that garden hose, and when I do that, I can wet down the entire classroom, right? I can shoot it out the back door into the hallway. I mean, what, what, what happens when I put my thumb over that garden hose? Well, I increase velocity. That's what I did. I increased velocity. And so uh, this is just an analogy of how these jet pumps work. And so uh, just keep this in mind that when we restrict the opening on the garden hose, we increase velocity of water coming out of it. So when we look at these jets or these ejectors, well, actually, before we get to that slide, let me explain to you. Uh, uh, I had several children and most of them, all of them had science fair projects. And we created a science fair project that will, is gonna help demonstrate how these ejectors work, quite frankly. Uh, we took a piece of three quarter inch copper tubing like you see on your screen there, and I pressed a nozzle on the inside of that tubing. So we put the nozzle on the end, pressed it in there, and then uh, drilled a hole right about where that nozzle was at, and I soldered in another little smaller piece of copper tubing into that hole. On the end of the tube, uh, I put a, a, raised a hose bib and hooked up a garden hose to it. Walk this thing outside, okay? Uh, just a simple contraption here. Walked it outside, turned the water on, and as the water began to flow, into these three quarter inch copper tube, it reaches the point where this nozzle is located. And what this nozzle did was very much like the previous slide when you put your thumb over the end of that garden hose. So when that water come out of there, it was coming out with a, a whole lot of uh, velocity. So it was shooting way, way out across the yard. I can't remember if it was my son or my daughter, but I asked whoever, which one it was to go ahead and uh, put their finger up over that little tube that's coming off to the side there. And I asked, do you feel anything? And they said, oh my God, yeah, it's like a vacuum cleaner. I can feel it's wanting to suck my finger down into that hole. Well, that velocity that's moving out of that tube creates a pulling effect behind it, like a suction effect behind it. This can be demonstrated oftentimes running down a highway uh, if you're in a car and you happen to be smoking a cigarette and all the windows are rolled up, it won't take but a second or two. And the next thing you know, the whole compartment's filled with smoke. So what do you do? Well, you roll, you don't even have to roll the window down. You just crack it a little bit, a couple of inches, and watch what happens. You know, all that smoke starts to be pulled out that opening in that window. Why? because of the velocity of the air that's moving by it. And so it's the same thing that happens here. That velocity creates a suction effect or creates a vacuum effect. And that's how a jet pump is able to pull water up out of a well or a cistern or a pond of that nature. So when we look at these jets, and I've got both of them on the screen now, uh, the shallow well on the left, the deep well on the right, the shallow well gets mounted horizontal and to the front of the pump. The deep well gets mounted vertically, uh, much closer to the water source, but in either case, there are, in fact, nozzles inside these jet assemblies. So when this jet pump is working and it's running and it's powered up, and some people I don't think realize this, but there is a small portion of the water that that pump pumps. There's a small portion of it that is directed back into that ejector on the bottom side, it simply makes a U-turn and it flows through that nozzle and we already know what happens after that nozzle gets a hold of that water. It shoots it out of there under high velocity. It creates that suction. And that suction is what's necessary for that jet pump to bring water from the water source. Sometimes if you were to have a jet pump that pumped very little or, or no water at all, uh, there's a good chance that that nozzle is either plugged or partially plugged. Because when that happens, and you understand what we've talked about up to this point, 
if that nozzle's plugged or partially plugged, you're not creating velocity. And if you don't create velocity, you're not creating suction. And if you don't create suction, you're not getting any water to the pump. Therefore, it would pump little, if any, water at all. Uh, they do build on these shallow well ejectors up front here. You might see there's a plug. There's a little pipe plug that uh, is, is uh, mounted onto the front of that ejector. That's actually called a clean-out plug. So that that could be uh, removed. And you could go into that opening, that port there, with a piece of copper wire and perhaps dislodge anything that might have lodged in that nozzle. So, again, that's called a clean-out plug up there in the front. The deep well is no different. Um, water's going to come down a, 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 a secondary pipe, as you'll see here in a minute, but for the same reason. That water's got to come down that pipe, make that U-turn at the bottom of that ejector, come up through that nozzle. And that's where that suction is created to bring water into the uh, into the pump and and allow the pump to pump water. So when we look at these two types of pumps, right? I mean, we just got an explanation of how these ejectors work. But when we look at these two types of jet pumps, this first one being a shallow well, uh, oftentimes it can be referred to as what we would call a single pipe system, meaning there is only one pipe that leaves the pump on the suction side and runs to the water source. Uh, so uh, one pipe, that's it, single pipe. Uh, the other way that we define a shallow well pump from a deep well pump is the vertical distance. I don't care about horizontal, only the vertical distance from the inlet of this pump to the water source has to be 25 feet or less. And in fact, the truth be known, uh, here in the Midwest where, where I reside, I mean, I tell contractors all the time, uh, you might want to start uh, questioning anything over 20 feet. Uh, maybe you want to either put a submersible in or go to a deep well because we're not at sea level. And at sea level, uh, you could, in fact, get 25 feet of lift, but we're not. So that does vary. So 20 feet, 20, 20, 25 feet, that's a vertical distance only, again, from the even if you had an imaginary line that come out of here from the uh, suction side of that pump down to the water source, not the foot valve, but where the water's at, um, that's where we're measuring. And that's got to be less than 25 feet. And speaking about that water level, I have been challenged on this in classroom before. I've had contractors ask me, they said, well, now, wait a minute. You said that we're simply measuring from uh, the inlet of the pump down to the water level. And I said, yes, that's exactly what I said. And they said, well, I don't understand because we're actually pulling water in down here in this uh, foot valve that's at the bottom of that pump down there at the bottom. Uh, why would you not measure down there? Well, the reason is that if you took a glass of water and you filled it full of water and you put a straw in that full glass of water, I looked at the guy and I said, where do you think the water level inside that straw would be? Well, everybody knows the answer to that, right? I mean, he looked at me and he said, well, he said, yeah, it would be at the same level it is in the glass. And I said, that's exactly right. And so when you put your lips on the top of that glass or that straw and you begin to suck water out of there, you're only having to lift it from here up to the top because it's already up to here in the straw. Same thing occurs in the jet pump, right, uh, where they have that uh, suction line going down there. Uh, that's going to fill with water up to the static level. And so, again, when we talk about this distance for these jet pumps, we're simply measuring from uh, an imaginary line representing the inlet down to the water source itself. Deep well jet pumps. Uh, well, here's a good visual for you. If there's two pipes running to the water source, it's not a shallow well jet pump. It's a deep well jet pump. And so... Uh, deep well jet pumps will have two water lines that will run to the water source. The diagram on your screen is showing this in a well. Uh, but by putting this ejector or this jet much down uh, closer to that water source, that's where we're creating that suction. And so with a deep well jet pump, uh, the truth is we can go over 100 feet. Um, if you get the right nozzle uh, built into this uh, ejector, and they're all designed for different depths, uh, you can lift water probably closer to 100, 110 feet with, uh, with a deep well ejector. But again, um, shallow wells 25 feet or less. Deep well is obviously more than 25 feet. Shallow well is a single pipe system. 
with the ejector mounted right on the front. A deep well is a two-pipe system with the ejector mounted closer to the water source. So enough on the jet pumps for the moment. Uh, we're going to switch gears here now. and We're going to go to the second type of above ground pumps. And this second type of above ground pumps are referred to as centrifugal pumps. And just like jet pumps within, I'm sorry, I advanced that slide too quick, but just like uh, jet pumps uh, within the centrifugal pump category, uh, there are two subcategories of uh, centrifugal pumps as well. And I'll outline those here in a minute or two. A little, little perhaps entertainment, a little tongue in cheek. A lot of times when I'm in classroom, I think to understand uh, how a centrifugal pump works and the truth be known, really, if you just boil it right down to the bare facts, every pump that we make is, is a centrifugal pump. Let's, let's talk about that. If you were to go on YouTube tonight, uh, if you want a little entertainment, maybe some of you have done this already, but uh, all you need is two search words. One is uh, obviously a merry-go-round, but the second one would be a motorcycle. And it doesn't matter which one you put first, you're going to get the same results. But what you're going to see in this YouTube clip is you're going to see this merry-go-round sitting out in this playground, and these couple of young strapping young men, actually, not, not kids, uh, come up and they decide they're going to ride this. And so one gets on one side, one gets on the other. They actually put their butt up against that top rail and they hold on each side with their hands. Uh, they're just adjacent to each other. This third guy comes along. He takes his motorcycle and he lays it down on the ground. And he engages the rear wheel of that motorcycle with the bottom ring of this merry-go-round and he begins to throttle it up a little bit. Well, that friction of that tire running on that bottom ring actually started to spin that merry-go-round, but it didn't go very fast. They were they were they were wanting to see, you know, what they could do. Well, he revved it on up. Um, I'm not going to give you the spoiler here. The spoiler is these guys do a disappearing act, so it's almost magic. They they disappear in a single frame, and they don't do that very gracefully at all. But I can tell you that those boys on that merry-go-round got the experience firsthand. Centrifugal force. So when we look at centrifugal force, uh, sometimes we see this, or maybe oftentimes we see this on uh, weather reports. This is an aerial satellite view of a hurricane. It's a spinning action that takes place. And just like the kids that got thrown out of the merry-go-round as this hurricane spins uh, faster and faster, the cloud formations start to move away from the center. Uh, and by the way, the center down there, this little thing here, sometimes I ask, you know, anybody know what they call that? Well, everybody knows what that is. That's the eye, right? The eye of a hurricane. Well, when you look at a pump impeller, it also has an eye. <laughs> so uh, this is just a, an example of an impeller that's going to be in that centrifugal pump. So uh, the water coming in the inlet and uh, comes right into the eye. It's a similar impeller in those jet pumps as well. We're bringing water into the eye of this impeller. And as this impeller spins, because it's threaded onto the motor shaft, it turns at 3,450 RPM. So as that impeller is spinning uh, very rapidly, it's throwing that water that comes into the eye, it's throwing it out these veins here. And you can kind of see these veins uh, if you look right at the edge of this impeller. And so it throws it to the outside, just like the hurricane moves the clouds out, like the merry-go-round uh, vacated the kids from the, the merry-go-round. Um, so water comes in through that eye and it exits as this impeller is turning uh, right out those veins. This is what that same thing would look like in a typical centrifugal pump. This uh, blue area here in the middle of that impeller would represent the eye where the water is coming into it. And as that impeller is rapidly spinning, again inside that pump casting, it throws that water out and that water just travels that exit path. Uh, right out the top uh, to, uh, to the discharge. And so again, when we look at these centrifugal pumps, uh, they're very, very uh, simple in nature. The two types of centrifugal pumps are now pictured on your screen. The one on the left is what we refer to as a straight centrifugal. The one on the right is referred to as a self-primer. Look at those two. They're both centrifugal pumps, but just look at the two fronts on those pumps. Um, Again, I don't know why or how uh, these names got applied to these pumps, uh, straight centrifugal. Um, you know, why do they call it that? I have an opinion. My opinion is, is that the water is coming in the inlet right here, the suction port, 
And as it enters that suction port, it goes right directly straight into the eye of that impeller that sits right behind that. Uh, that doesn't happen on the self primer. So maybe that's why they call that the straight centrifugal. But as I already mentioned, <clears throat> they're the uh, simplest of, of all the pumps. Uh, but one thing that uh, we want to be aware of when it comes to these above ground pumps is that those impellers that you saw earlier, they will not remove air. So these pumps must be primed uh, and filled with water. Uh, and they must stay full all the time uh, in order for them to operate. When it comes to the impellers inside these centrifugal pumps, in many cases, as an F&W distributor or contractor, you have a choice when it comes to impellers. Uh, you have a choice between an injection molded plastic impeller on the left-hand side, which is uh, manufactured by our own company, uh, one of our divisions. Uh, so it is a company that we, we have ownership of. And then there's the one on the right-hand side, which is a no-lead uh, brass impeller. Plastic injection molded is a very precise method of molding plastic. If you if you produce a thousand of those impellers uh, in one run, I would tell you that what you have are a thousand clones. You, you got simply a, one thousand clones. They're identical. There's no difference from one to the next. With the cast brass, on the other hand, um, geometrically, it 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 it's it's very very consistent, but the weight can vary. And so on the uh, bronze impellers, uh, we're going to balance those. But I guess before we go to the, that one, well, there we go. Um, so every one of the bronze impellers will be balanced 100%. There's not a brass impeller that goes through our facility that doesn't come across this, uh, this uh, quality check here. And so the operator will put the impeller on a shaft, run it up to full RPMs. And just like balancing a tire, uh, the strobe light is going to uh, indicate to that operator where that impeller is out of balance. And unlike a tire that you add weight to, to bring it into balance, with the bronze impellers, uh, when those impellers are out of balance, they take them off the shaft uh, and they'll grind some material off this back side. So it's not uncommon. In fact, it's, it's more common than it, it, it's the rule, not the exception. If you pick up a brass uh, flint walling impeller, whether it's on a pump, in a pump, or as a replacement part, uh, you're probably going to see some of that scuff on the back side or the skirt of that impeller. And that's really an indication that that impeller has been balanced. So uh, that happens. And then, of course, uh, the number of impellers that are put into a pump are referred to as stages. And particularly when it comes to these centrifugal pumps, uh, you can get these in either a single stage uh, design, which is a single impeller, or you can get them in multi-stage or two-stage or three-stage. and and so just be aware that that's what it's referred to as. It's referred to as a stage. And when they, I had a guy come up to me after a meeting one day and he said, Mr. Painter, he said, golly, he said, I didn't know that. I got a warehouse full of these pumps and I see where some said multi-stage, others said single stage. And I had no idea what that meant until I come into this class today. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about just the various stages. Here's a, a cutaway of a three-stage uh, centrifugal pump that you can see. I actually had this pump on display at a, uh, a distributor open house one day. I was on the uh, western side of Chicago and a contractor walked up to my little display table that I had. He saw this pump sitting on the table and I thought the guy was gonna wet his pants, seriously. I mean, I've never seen anybody get so daggone excited over a pump and he looked at me and goes, he said, dude, th th those are all brass impellers in there. I said, yes, I, I know that, sir. He said, well, I didn't think any pump company made pumps with brass impellers anymore. I said, well, the truth is when it comes to a flint and walling brand, you've got a choice. You can, you can choose plastic, which is uh, very common in most all of our competitor pumps, or you can choose the no-lead uh, bronze. Uh, it's, a, it's a contract of choice. He said, well, I think that might solve a problem I've been having. I said, what kind of problem you have? He said, well, I got these pumps all around this big lake up here between us and Wisconsin. And he said, I got, I got centrifugal pumps in, the, in that lake for irrigation. And he said, every year, every, every year I've got to go out and I got to replace the impellers in every single one of them. And I looked at him. I said, that's, that's, that's pretty dramatic there, dude. He goes, well, he said, there's been some bad years where I've had to go out twice on the same pump in the same season. I go, what's going on with the impellers? He said, well, I take the pumps apart. They're just all in shreds. I said, so the plastic impellers are shredding. 
He goes, yeah. And I said, well, there's something causing that. He goes, well, I know exactly what's causing that. And I said, what is it? He said, shells. I said, like seashells. He goes, yeah. I said, those are getting inside the pump. He goes, absolutely. I said, well, let me ask you a question. On that suction line that runs out into that lake, you got a foot valve on the bottom of that? Yes, sir. I said, well, every foot valve I've ever seen has a screen around it. Oh, it's got its screens on there. I said, well, how are these shells? He told me these shells were the size of my fingernail on my little finger. I said, how in the world are they getting inside the pump because the screen on that foot valve is, is, doesn't have openings big enough to allow them to pass through. He said, no, nope, they don't come through that way. They come through as larva, as larva. And they get inside the pump and they grow and they multiply and they reproduce and they form these shells. And as this pump turns and powers on it, it, it just it, it crushes all these shells. They become extremely abrasive and they shred my impellers. I imagine those brass impellers will work a lot better, won't they? And I looked at that old boy and I said, let me tell you something. We've done a lot of destructive testing up at Clinton Walling. We've deadheaded these pumps for 30 minutes. We've run them dry for hours and hours and hours. I, we've run sand through them. But, sir, I can't tell you that we've ever done a test where we've tried to pump shells through these things. So I don't know how it's going to react. But if I had your track record, I might consider rolling the dice. And so that was the end of that conversation. I saw him a year later. And you probably figure out the end of that story. He replaced all those pumps, and he never had to go back out on a single pump due to any type of impeller damage at all. So I suppose there are times where a bronze impeller might have some advantages over a plastic. But for those of you that might be questioning, well, how do they perform? They're comparable. What about quality? What about reliability? Again, they're comparable. Our warranty return rates on those category of pumps are <clears throat> less than a half a percent. So very, very comparable. This second part of the uh, centrifugal pumps are what's called a self-primer, a little bit of a misnomer there. I, again, I don't know why sometimes they call these pumps what they do, but uh, self-primer pumps, as you can see by the bullet, is oftentimes uh, referred to as lawn sprinkler pumps. But the second bullet is what's more important. Although they are quote unquote self-priming, all pumps and all pumps, all means all, and that's all, all will ever mean. So all pumps, including the self-primer, needs to be primed initially in order to uh, pump water. And so uh, don't let that throw you that a uh, self-primer pump doesn't need to be primed. Oh, yes, it does. The very first time it's installed, at least, it will need to be primed at that point in time. So again, when we look at these centrifugals, uh, the straight centrifugal and the self-primer, here's where the self-primer feature actually would come into play. Let's just suppose that we had a small irrigation job out here and uh, we had a centrifugal pump installed, a straight centrifugal. Well, something happened to the system. Uh, it got a leak. Uh, the timer didn't call for the pump to run. And so this system just leaked down. All the water leaked out. Uh, the pressure went down to zero. And I suppose, depending upon how this uh, straight centrifugal was installed, that it's potential, uh, potentially uh, feasible that the water could have drained down inside the pump at least to the lowest portion of the inlet, the suction, that little dashed line right across there, all right? Um, the bottom portion of that casting would retain some water. There's a drain plug down here. You might be able to see it right next to my cursor if you wanted to actually drain that water out. But nonetheless, this pump's out. It's installed. The system got a leak, drained to zero, and now the water in the pump sits down to here. Uh, next day, the pump comes, uh, gets told to come on, and it doesn't pump any water. Why? Well, because, again, these impellers aren't like fan blades. They can't move air, and so the only thing they can move is the liquid. In our case, it's water. But you've got the overwhelming majority of that impeller back here that's exposed uh, and sticking up out of that water. And so with a straight centrifugal, you're going to have to uh, resolve the leak issue, fix it, and then reprime this pump. Uh, to get that water uh, so that that uh, impeller is fully submerged again. If the same thing happened on the quote unquote self primer, well, the same thing meaning that it could drain down to the bottom portion of its inlet, you can see on a self primer the reason why now the inlets are so high, uh, much higher than a straight centrifugal. And that is for this reason if it does drain down, something does go awry, 
and it drains down to the lowest portion that it can inside this pump, which is again at the bottom of the uh, suction port or the inlet side of this pump. That impeller that sits behind is still fully submerged in water. And so you get the leak fixed, you power this pump back up, and it will pick right up and, and take off and go because it kind of already is it, it's self priming by virtue of retaining the water. Uh, retaining the impeller submerged in water. That's why it gets its name self-priming. So again, if these uh, circles kind of indicated where the impeller would be inside these pumps, um, you can see that the one on the left, the overwhelming majority is sticking up out of the water, and the one on the right, all of it is still submerged in water. So that's the difference between the self-primer and the straight centrifugal. When we talk about priming a pump, uh, when we talk about priming a pump, uh, measure of patience is uh, really the best advice I can give here. Um, I used to have a, uh, I sound like my old man more and more every day uh, towards my kids. In fact, I am an old man anymore, but I used to have a car that I had to put water in the radiator every damn day because it leaked like a sieve. And I'd go out every morning and I'd pour water in that radiator until that water come up out of that, uh, out of that, uh, uh, snout right there and I put the cap on I'd leave come back the next morning go through the same exercise my stepbrother happened to see me one day and I was taking the jug back to the garage and he said hey he said um, saw what you just did and I said what putting water in that radiator he said yeah and I said well I shouldn't be too hard I do it every day he goes yeah but I noticed that you didn't do it right and I said well, <laughs> what do you mean I didn't do it right he said well he said uh I don't think you got all the air out of it. And I said, well, the heck I didn't. The water come right out over the top of the snout before I put the lid on. He said, well, let's go back out. And so we walked back out to the car, popped the hood, and opened the uh, radiator cap up. And guess what? I couldn't see any water in that thing at all. It was kind of a surprise to me. He said, now go ahead and throw some more water in there. So I said, well, what happened to the water that I put in? He said, well, you had air in there, and the air came up to the top. That's why you don't see any water. So pour more water in there. I poured, poured it in until it come out over the top of the neck again, and I put the cap on. He strapped my hand. He said, hey, don't get so impatient. I go, why? He said, see those air bubbles? You got to let those escape first. And so we did it a third time, and eventually there was no more air bubbles that came up. And then I put the cap on. He said, hey, you do it this way? you might not have to do this every day anymore. So when it comes to priming these pumps, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we are able to get rid of all the air, not just in the pump casting itself, but that suction line, obviously, wherever it runs to, we'd like to fill that up with water too. And then, of course, these air pockets and these bubbles must be eliminated during this process, and that just takes some time for that air to purge out of there. So that's why I mentioned early on that we have to have a a measure of patience, but uh, failure to prime a pump for the or, or for the pump to keep its prime, that's our number one cause for initial pump failure. So we want to not hastily move through that and, and make sure we get that prim pump primed properly. Uh, another above ground pump, and it's got its own uh, web conference, which is will be coming up on the schedule if it's not, is this city water pressure booster pump. I referenced it earlier on in this uh, web conference. Uh, this is integral, it's all self-contained, it's plug and play, uh, but it is an awesome pump for uh, boosting uh, water pressure. Like I mentioned, it's a virtual plug and play. It's got inlet and outlet, as you can see, inlet on the uh, side facing you. The discharges out the top, these are one inch uh, stainless steel flange. There's a flow switch in there, so this pump operates off its own flow switch. You have to have a demand of water that is at or above seven tenths of a gallon per minute in order for that flow switch to activate. It's got a little storage tank built up front with a little air uh, charge in it. Just, I mean, it, again, I mentioned this is a plug and play. Everything's in, integral to this pump itself. And it's got onboard uh, protection and diagnostics. Uh, we make this available in two models, a half and a one horsepower. And again, like I mentioned, uh, there is a separate web conference that we go through these components, uh, the functionality, we talk about proper installation, and then we go through the onboard uh, diagnostics and protection. And uh, like I mentioned, that's a separate web conference for that. <clears throat> As we wind down, we're gonna spend just a little bit of time on these uh, submersible pumps. And again, uh, in other web conferences that we, 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 we 
peel the layers back and go much, much deeper into these. Uh, but with a submersible pump, if you look at the way it's constructed, you've got a discharge up here at the top, uh, followed by a stack, and that stack is actually the pump in portion of the uh, submersible pump. So inside of the submersible pump are impellers that are stacked one upon top of another. So a uh, submersible pump is always going to be a multi-stage uh, pump having many, many, many impellers in it. Here dead center is the suction stream, so that's where the water is going to enter into the uh, uh, submersible pump. And then, of course, on the bottom is the motor. We manufacture all these components in Kendallville, and when it comes to submersibles, you have a couple of cho choices. You've got uh, thermal plastic like you see here in the center of the screen, uh, thermal plastic discharge, uh, thermal plastic motor mount, also available in cast iron. So there's a cast iron discharge and a cast iron motor mount, and then of course are all stainless steel uh, discharge and motor mount. Uh, so the three different, kind of a good, better, best scenario there, I suppose. Uh, but when we look at the stack, uh, like I mentioned, uh, submersible pumps, they just uh, utilize uh, impellers stacked upon top of each other. One thing to note about these impellers, whether they're in a submersible pump or a centrifugal pump, is that the more impellers that are in a pump, uh, each of those impellers are going to run that pressure up, so uh, it allows the pump to produce a uh, higher and higher water pressure with the addition of uh, multiple impellers. So, for example, uh, in, in this uh, example here, I've got uh, what you're looking at over there on the left-hand side is a uh, not really a pump that I see much sold in, in irrigation because that I, I know because it's got eight stages in it. Uh, that's a 10-gallon minute pump. Um, but that's what I'm talking about when we're talking about stages. And Flint and Walling has never, ever destaged their submersible pumps, uh, where I know uh, that has been a practice that has occurred within the pump industry where they've taken cost out and they'll take impellers out and they'll tighten the tolerances down on everything else that's left. Uh, but you got a pump that's, uh, yeah, it costs a little less, but it easily sand locks and, and anything else that gets in there because the tolerances are so damn gone tight. A uh, submersible pump, unlike a, uh, an above ground pump, uh, utilizes what we call a, as a water cooled motor, where all the above ground pumps, those are all air cooled. And when a pump is put in a well, like you see here on your screen, uh, that, that cooling is, is almost natural in effect. So as, as this pump is running, uh, we get water moving past that motor into this screen and on out the discharge up to the top. And so you kind of get a natural flow of water moving past that motor, which helps dissipate heat and carry that heat away. Um, on the other hand, uh, so when it comes to these submersible pumps, they can be used in a well, like I just demonstrated uh, with a previous uh, slide, uh, kind of like a conventional water system, or they can be submerged in a lake or a pond. In lake or pond applications, uh, while they're designed to operate vertically, these pumps can be installed on their side. Uh, we try to keep them at a minimum of 45 degrees, and, and what I really would want is anything uh, short of flat horizontal, so even if you're 20 degrees, you got a pump that's going to last a long, long time. Uh, there are companies out there that actually make sleds uh, to put these pumps in at that and hold them at that angle uh, so that they're easily pulled in and pulled out. But when it comes to a submersible pump and, and it's being used in a pond, again, these are water-cooled motors, and it's the water that typically passes by that motor uh, that carries that heat away. And again, when these are in wells, that's a natural occurring thing that takes place because uh, this this pump is sitting down in essentially a, a piece of pipe. Uh, but when you take this pump and you put it out into a lake, well, uh, you power this up to uh, uh, irrigate with, and where's the water going to enter? Well, I can answer that. It's going to come right through the sides. Uh, you're not going to get a lot of water flowing past that motor. So there was a time, and I want to make sure I state this clear, and then we're, we're going to be done with this conference. But uh, there was a time that these motors could overheat because you don't have the water flowing past it. And so it was not uncommon to uh, have a shroud build up. And, and this shroud was, um, I mean, they were built in garages. They, they utilized a piece of plastic pipe and they would slice the end of it so they could 
uh, fold it all together and clamp it up here at the top. The, the point is this, the point is, is that the only way that water could get into the suction screen of that pump is it would have to come through the bottom of that pipe. And by coming through the bottom of that pipe, it would force that water to move past that motor and then out to discharge. Now, when it comes to these uh, shrouds, or some people call them flow inducers, I don't know, there's a number of names out there for the same thing. When it comes to these shrouds, I'm not, I'm not telling you that you have to put these on every submersible pump that you put in a lake or a pond. And in fact, I would tell you that if you're putting in two horsepower or less, so if you got a horse, horse and a half, or two horsepower submersible you're throwing in that pond, the technology on those motors has improved so much over the last 15 to 20 years that there is no need to have to shroud those things and no worries that they overheat. However, if you get into larger applications where we're using maybe three, five, or seven and a half horsepower motors on a submersible pump, uh, those motors are gonna need to be shrouded because they do need to have a certain amount of water moving past them to dissipate heat. So the applications where that shroud is going to be used to force that water to come in the bottom, up the side, around the motor, and out. Okay, uh, this floating fountain pond pump, I'm gonna have a web conference up on that as well. Uh, it also, as I mentioned early on, utilizes a submersible pump. We put this submersible pump down into this slotted uh, PVC screen. Uh, this has some really, really nice features to it. It ships with three different fountain spray, uh, patterns. Um, and light kits and all kinds of things that um, make this a very feasible product, very competitively priced as well. So um, today they're available in either a half 115 or a half to a one horse uh, 230 volt. And the only thing we recommend is that you've got to have at least a minimum of five feet of water, the depth of water to, to float these out and, and make them functional. So again, I'm going to go back into the details of this product on separate uh, separate web conferences. But those are, this is an indication, these are cell phone photos, not the best, but they're indications of the various water uh, fountain patterns uh, that you can have. Uh, you can light them up. So we're at the end of the web conference and uh, I'm gonna, I, I wanna show you next week's schedule and then just one other, I got two slides after this one, but if you look at that, I wanna leave this up for just a second. If you look at that, um, these are just line drawings. Um, and I would I would ask that, you know, as you, as you move across this screen, if you can identify those pumps, you're not looking at model numbers, you're not looking at catalogs, you're simply doing a visual inspection. So for example, um, uh, this pump down here versus this pump over here. We just talked about that one. That one's pretty much a no-brainer. So it, the whole purpose of this uh, this uh, conference today was to be able to look at a variety of pumps uh, that are used in irrigation and uh, just to be able to identify one from another. So the, uh, let's see, we're down here on irrigation 101. I got two uh, web conferences next week, uh, one on the 28th, which is the House of Resistance, a real easy to use pump sizing model. Uh, but like I said, when you want, go to the website and you see this uh, this schedule of events, uh, check back because next week we're gonna have all of June's posted up there. On that same page that you're on when you register for your uh, web recordings are these archive recordings. I record them all and so uh, even though I try to do all of them live, uh, there are recorded versions of these on the archive recording. So all you need to do is click on the one you're interested in and you can watch it at your convenience and on your timeline. So with that, I'm going to close this web conference off. Uh, again, we're about 10 minutes shy of the hour, but uh, I do appreciate your attendance. Uh, please be safe and uh, until next time, take care and have a great weekend. Thank you, this web conference has now ended.